Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. We're we're delighted to have you here. This is going to be this is going to be a lot of fun. I mean, I I always wondered what it's like when journalists get together after something and sit and have a drink and talk with each other about what it's like. Well, we're going to get a little insight. That's what it's going to be like today, and we're looking forward to hearing. <laughs> Close. <this reading. laughs> it's going to be really great. We're looking forward to it. Thank you all for coming. We're delighted to have you here. Of course, this is something that we do jointly with the Schieffer School of Journalism at TCU, and Bob Schieffer has uh, both lent his name to TCU, and we're, he lets us borrow it here once in a while, and we're able to do this jointly with him, and it's a wonderful, wonderful program, and we're able to bring to you, and I want to say thanks to our friends at UT who make it possible for us to make this available for all of us. So it's going to be a great session. I should tell you, Steve Cole is on the way. We got a phone call from him. He's a little bit delayed. He's going to be coming in route, but we're not going to wait. We've got too many people here and too much fun. So we'll get started. Let me turn it to you, Bob. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamry. Uh, I think these two will be able to <laughs> hold the space here while we're waiting for Steve Call to come. You know, uh, welcome uh, on behalf of CSIS and the uh, Schieffer School down at TCU. Uh, they always say in Washington that the longer the title, the less important uh, the job is. The shortest title in Washington is president, and we all, we all remember that. It's kind of that way with biographies, too. Sometimes the longer the biography, uh, you know. It, so we won't spend very much Good. time introducing <laughs> these two fellows today. David Ignatius, columnist, Washington Post, former editor of the International uh, Herald Tribune, multiple awards, uh, six novels, and I'll tell you, he's done something the rest of us haven't. Uh, one of his books uh, has actually, well, a couple of them have been made into movies, <laughs> and which was a uh, Unless you know something I don't know. <laughs> Body of Lies, which was a, a big uh, box office hit. Tom Friedman, uh, three Pulitzers, four books, uh, columnist for the New York Times, and he does have, uh, David, one thing over you, uh, one of his books, uh, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, actually has been, has become a song. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should add that I'm the one that wrote the song. <laughs> so but it did. If you haven't heard it, it's absolutely <laughs> priceless. We will not be hearing it today. <laughs> and speaking of short, uh, with, as we start to do this, uh, I was just thinking about this coming over here questions, and uh, Steve will join us here uh, shortly. I don't even have to ask yes. questions today because There's the Steve. subjects, is Steve there? Yeah, here right. he comes. Yeah. I'm going to introduce him on the way up here. Steve Cole, longtime foreign correspondent, staff writer for The New Yorker, uh, six books including Ghost Wars, which is kind of the uh, definitive uh, work on Afghanistan uh, about right now, and uh, just two Pulitzers. So. <laughs> so, we're glad to have him today. And I was just saying, we, the, the, the subject. Tom's on the board, isn't he? Yeah. Is that a conflict? <laughs> right. yeah, <laughs> the subjects are so obvious, we can keep them really short. I mean, all I have to say is Middle East, Tom. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> anything happened this week? <laughs> uh, I've been away. It's been very quiet. Um, you know, my, my, uh, just to dive in, uh, I'll just give you my, my very short take. Um, I think that uh, what happened this last week in the confrontation between uh, the Obama administration um, and Israel, uh, it, had, it, it, it had a lot of different levels to it. Um, I think at one level, uh, it, was, it had really almost nothing to do with this particular housing project of 1,600 apartments. Uh, to be built in um, uh, an area that was um, uh, in, in what's considered uh, the annexed part of East Jerusalem. I think part of the reaction of the Secretary of State, the President, and the Vice President was in the name of every Secretary of State, every President, every American ambassador who has had Israeli settlements shoved in their face, slipped under their door, uh, slipped beside them, prevaricated um, and um, uh, pushed forward against uh, the will, uh, interests, um, uh, and urging of the United States of America. So at one level, this was a lot of anger that had been building up in the bureaucracy, I believe, over many, many years. Um, 
At the second level, I think what you saw reflected here, this came out a little bit in Dave Petraeus's um, uh, background briefing about Israel, um, which came out last week, um, a sense that, you know, um, Israel, we, we do a lot for you uh, in the world. We, um, we're trying to organize a global coalition to uh, defuse the Iranian nuclear threat, which is in our interest, but you would be one of the chief victims of that if we can't. Uh, we took out Saddam Hussein for our interest, but after all, Saddam is uh, the man who launched uh, multiple Scud attacks on your country and was offering $25,000 ransom for any Palestinian who... Uh, any Palestinian who committed suicide. Um, we, uh, uh, we have $3 billion in military aid, the most advanced military equipment for Israel in the FY 2011 budget. Um, and we defended Israel against the Goldstone Report at the United Nations. Having done all that, and then when you consider the particular context we're in right now, a context in which, to his credit, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's economic and security policies in the West Bank have strengthened Salam Fayyad and really helped produce uh, probably the most uh, effective Palestinian interlocutor we've had, I think, ever, including Yasser Arafat, um, and a Palestinian security force that um, has won the grudging respect of Israel. Um, we have a Sunni Arab world obsessed with Iran and therefore more willing to, I think, engage with and support Israel than ever before. Given all of that, is it too much to ask by the United States of Israel that it engage in what I would call a win-win strategy, which is to say, you know what, President Obama, the American people, this buds for you, okay? We are, we're not gonna do any building in Jerusalem. We're not gonna do any building in the West Bank. Palestinians say that's the problem. We're not gonna do anything. We're gonna simply test whether there really is a Palestinian partner on the other side. It's a win-win if there is, Negotiations will advance, and if there isn't, it'll be clear to the whole world. But instead of going for win-win, it seems to me that they wanted to opt for lose-lose, which is um, uh, insist on these policies, which will only cause tension with the United States and give Palestinians and those of ill will an excuse to blame Israel for where we are. So I think that's the junction of where we are. That's how I see it. I believe the president did exactly the right thing in drawing this red line, uh, exactly the right thing for American interests. And um, I personally uh, supported it. I think there's one thing still missing, though, that, um, and I'll stop after this. I do believe that right now there are five key players in this equation. There is uh, the Palestinian government of Salam Fayyad. There is the network of resistance, which is Iran, Hamas, and Hezbollah. There's the uh, moderate Arab states. There's Israel and America. Of those five players, only two have a strategy. Uh, Fayyad has a strategy and the network of resistance, Iran, Hamas, and Hezbollah have a strategy. And by the way, they are opposed. Um, they are mortal enemies right now. Uh, America, uh, the moderate Arab states, um, and Israel, I do not believe have a coherent long-term strategy for how to resolve this conflict. And I think that while it was necessary, what the Obama administration did, it is not sufficient. I think this administration is the weakest Middle East policy-making team I've ever seen. Um, in fact, I couldn't even tell you who makes Middle East policy in this administration. It's a subject I have some interest in. Um, and while it was important and necessary to draw this red line, it is not sufficient. Ultimately, we need a real strategy. David. Well, I, Tom, uh, Tom literally wrote the book on this subject, mm -hmm. and, and you just saw uh, why he is so authoritative. I, I agree with what Tom said. I just would add a, a few points. I mean, Tom, um, it's true that uh, there are lots of different wheels that spin in this administration's foreign policy team at different speeds, and uh, that makes it uh, difficult to follow policy and often difficult for them to formulate policy. But uh, on the question of who makes Middle East policy, I think the answer is clear. Uh, President Obama does. Hmm. I think that he takes this issue very personally. I think it's no accident that the first thing he did, really, when he got into the Oval Office was begin to make phone calls to the leaders in the region. He called uh, uh, the Palestinians, he called the Egyptians, he called the Saudis, he called the Israelis. He said, this issue is going to be crucial for me. What's the first big interview that he gave? It was to an Arab Al television right. station. You know, consistently, on the, on the way to giving his speech in Cairo, he was signaling, this issue is going to be mine. And then he gave this very memorable speech 
uh, in which he really you know, planted the flag, if you will, as an American president saying, I am committed to reaching out to countries that have, we've seen as our adversaries, countries that are across this divide in the, in the Muslim world and trying to engage them, trying to uh, make a new push for peace. It was very much personal presidential diplomacy. Uh, Netanyahu came here very early in the president's uh, term. Uh, he w had a meeting in the, in the Oval Office. He came away just stunned by the intensity of the president's uh, feeling about, about settlements. Uh, went up to Capitol Hill thinking he'd get a much friendlier reception there, and, and, right. and he didn't. And Net Netanyahu went home uh, really concerned that there was, there, was, you know, there was real unity in Washington on, on, on these issues. Uh, I think the Israelis were really, really concerned, the, the, the Netanyahu government. Net Netanyahu did something very smart, which is he waited for the president's popularity to decline. I mean, you know, over these months, Obama got weaker. Yeah, and it, the, 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 that power leached away, and we've all watched that. That's the larger story that we're, that we're looking at. Uh, and, and I think that that did have repercussions in terms of, of Middle East uh, diplomacy. And in a way, uh, Netanyahu gave this administration a gift, which was to do something so outrageous, so blatantly inappropriate for an ally when Vice President Biden went to, went to Israel, that the administration found its voice, an administration that's really been struggling, suddenly began to speak with great intensity. And we, we've seen in the last week uh, uh, you know, a, a new conviction. You could say that, that this process, which just seemed as dead as can be, has, has got some new energy. Uh, like you, I, I'm, I'm very uncertain about where it's going to go. I, I would just add one other thing, uh, because I think that it's, it, it's, it's, it's a mistake to think that just getting angry at the Israelis about settlements, both at the beginning of the administration uh, and, and over in the last week, is really going really to be a decisive change. When the president came, came into office, many of his advisors argued that the way to start this process was not to focus on settlements, but to make a clear and coherent statement of all of the things that have basically been agreed in the, in the peace negotiations that we've all been watching for several decades. You know, we, we, as, we, as we often say, as Tom and I uh, write in our columns, uh, we all know what the, the settlement's going to look like. It's no mystery here. We could name all of, the, all of the basic elements of it. The Israelis know it. The Palestinians know it. But it's never said officially by the United States because we're afraid of uh, blocking the negotiating process. In truth, we're afraid of upsetting the Israelis by saying, look folks, Jerusalem is going to be uh, an issue on the table. And part of what we saw in this, in this last week was the Israeli right uh, insisting that the ambiguity that, that, the, that the U.S. and the Israelis have both drawn around this issue of Jerusalem uh, was intolerable, that, that everybody should know we're not going to give up one inch of Jerusalem. And here to, to show you what, how serious we are about it, uh, the Israeli interior minister was saying, we're going to you know, put these new settlements into East Jerusalem just as an emphatic statement. And I think the response isn't just to get angry at that, but to take the next step, which is to, which is to state clearly and directly what are the basic outlines as we go into this negotiation that we all know are going to be part of the, 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 the package. And, and I think if they don't do that, in truth, they'll let the opportunity that was handed to them uh, slip. Steve, would you like to uh, get in on this? Where do you see this going? You know, I don't really, literally don't have much to add of the same quality of, the, of, the, of that discourse. But just listening to the two of them, and I'm happy to talk about the things I know best, Pakistan and Afghanistan and other subjects. But listening to them confirmed an observation that from a greater distance I had uh, made over the last couple of weeks, which is that there's an anomaly here. Tom described it as the accumulation of anger in the bureaucracy, and David described it correctly as something that came from the president from the first time he had a bilateral in this new office. This uh, refusal to allow the Israeli settlement policies to go on past in American policy, whether, but the, the anomaly is that that is a landmark in American foreign policy decision making and in presidential action in the relationship with Israel, but it was detached from strategy. 
it wasn't brought to bear as leverage for the pursuit of something anyway that was achieved. And so you ended up having, in a sense, this eruption, some of it spontaneous as a result of the, the um, accident of Biden's visit, some of it calculated and accumulating. But my question is, maybe just to round this off with the two of them, is what is the right way to bring to bear American outrage about the settlement constructively toward a result? Because I, my memory, again, somewhat amateurish, is that Bush 41 sort of did that with the housing finance uh, problem a and managed actually to link it to a broader narrative of negotiation and progress. So what should be done in that respect? Well, I think it's a very good point. So I actually wrote my column about this for tomorrow, uh, apropos of that point. Um, if you don't tell anybody, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, nice. <laughs> don't tell anybody, I will, don't let it out of this room. Um, but uh, if we're going to have a fight, let's fight over something really big. OK. Um, and by the way, if we're going to work together, let's work together with Israel over something really big. So basically what I would argue, uh, and I think you're, 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 you're exactly right. How, how do you connect this with something larger? And that's why I start out by saying, Two people have strategies right now, as I can see it. So let's start there. Fayyad and the Iran Hezbollah um, Hamas strategy. Uh, Fayyad, I think, is the most interesting new player in the Middle East in a long, long time. He's in many ways the anti Yasser Arafat. Arafat's whole strategy was let's get international recognition for a Palestinian state, and then we'll build the institutions. Fayyad came along and said, no, no, no. You got it completely backwards. Let's build institutions, financial ones, uh, security ones that Israel can trust and we, our people can trust. Um, and then we declare a state. Okay. So that is what the path he's on. And he said, we're going to do this in 2011. By then, we will have our institutions up and running. So he's on, on that track. I think the Iranian Hamas, uh, Hezbollah strategy is multiple parts. I think they're out to. Uh, destroy Israel through first um, uh, a process of a combination of asymmetric warfare, <coughs> which we saw in Lebanon <coughs> and in the um, and in Gaza. Um, pour me just a drink here, one second. Um, excuse me. <coughs> so asymmetric warfare. Uh, second, delegitimizing Israel on the world stage by using asymmetric warfare you basically force Israel to um, engage in what some will call war crimes because Hamas and Hezbollah are nested among civilian population. Um, and then um, uh, lastly, uh, you um, try to attempt Israel into imperial overstretch. Iran's fundamental interest, Hamas's fundamental interest, and Hezbollah's fundamental interest is that the Israeli occupation of the West Bank be perpetuated because they believe that imperial overstretch will erode Israel morally, physically, and economically. So Fayyad and the Iranians are actually on a collision course, which is why you saw last week Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president, telling the Iranians to stay out of their business. The three other players are sitting on the sidelines. Uh, the Israelis have no clear long-term strategy. The Arab uh, moderates are completely feckless. Um, and, uh, and, the, and this administration, as you note, and as David noted, have not actually laid down where they want to come in. So what I say is, what the job of the other three is, is to support Fayyadism. Now it gets complicated, because Fayyad, because of the split among the Palestinians, Hamas in Gaza, and Fatah, Fayyad and Mahmoud Abbas, controlling the West Bank, they cannot enter into a final peace arrangement, because the Palestinian parliament cannot ratify it, because they're split between Hamas and Fatah. So what I believe the right strategy is, is a phased approach where we promote um, a Palestinian state within provisional boundaries. And that would be to give Palestinians a state, with all the accoutrements of it, in the, those areas of the West Bank known as areas A and B, basically. That is, all of the West Bank minus the blocks of Israeli settlements. That would be the interim solution. They would take over there as a state. And then phase two is, as David alluded to, then you would negotiate about refugees, Jerusalem, and final status. I believe that's the strategy we should be pursuing. My own view is that we should be laying that on the table. And as David said, and as you said, connect what we're doing here 
okay, to that larger strategy. And if that's the administration's approach, I don't know about it, but that seems to me how you connect this with that. Well, I just, just briefly, um, I think if, if um, I agree with Tom that uh, Salam Fayyad is uh, an important new player. Um, and I think his two-year transitional plan to get to Palestinian statehood uh, is something that, that we should support. I, like Tom, I, I, I've written saying, you know, our policy should be to forthrightly say, we back this transition to a state in two years. Um, when I wrote that, uh, the administration official called up and said, but that is our policy. And I said, well, you know, if that's our policy, you, know, you want to let people know. <laughs> because yeah, exactly. it's, you know, it's, it's news to me. Yeah, it's real, news um, to me, too. If, if, if Fayyad was here, what I think he would say to all of us is, uh, you know, I, I'm really glad that, 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 that Tom uh, in, endorses my plan. Uh, but what I need from the U.S. government is something more than that. What I need is m political momentum on precisely on the idea that the, there will be a final settlement, not something transitional, provisional, which, you know, sorry to say, folks, the Palestinians and Arabs just, you know, um, they're not going to buy that. The, uh, they're not going to be, they're going to, they will think this is an attempt to buy them off with, you know, a half a loaf, a third of a loaf, however much of the loaf it is, uh, and the Israelis are just going to hang on to the rest, and they'll end up um, uh, losing out, and they'll suffer a historic uh, reversal. So he would say, what you need to do is push now, clearly, on the broader context of negotiation. So I will have a political base when I finish my institution building to, to take the next step. And I, and I, think, he's, I think he's right. I think, you know, Tom, that uh, while that's a, a useful transitional approach, it won't build the, 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 the political support that's needed on the Palestinian side. And also, to be honest, it allows everybody, Israelis and Palestinians, to duck the hard issues. Yes. That's what we've been doing now for, you know, 30 years. Let and me just say, Doc, I think you, you, you are exactly right. Um, I couldn't go into the detail of it in what I wrote tomorrow, but uh, if, in, in the full plan, the idea is um, you would have a bilateral letter from the United States to the Palestinians that says we support negotiations on the basis of the June 4, 1967 boundaries, and you have a bilateral assurance to the Israelis, which Bush already basically gave, that we would support mutually agreed upon border adjustments. So I think as part of mm -hmm. this, you would have to have that absolutely from day one. Can I just say, I support the Friedman plan. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, um, While we're in the uh, neighborhood, uh, <laughs> let's, let's uh, shift over to Iran. How are how are we doing on Iran these days? Well, uh, you know what's happening, which is an attempt to adjust the sanctions so that they create conditions that support whatever residual resistance there is to the regime as it evolves over the next six or eight months, raises the price on the IRGC, and tries to find a way to have an effect on the Iranian Revolutionary Guards and its networks among the Iranian elites that is analogous to the effects that were created on Milosevic and his cronies, you know, in the late period of the Kosovo Would conflict. Would you think there's something. a real chance they can get meaningful sanctions? Oh, I'm, I'm sure that they can through the combination of multilateral sanctions and then targeted finance sanctions uh, raise the temperature some. Yes, I mean, you know, I. I, I, I'm not at all sure where things go with the Chinese at, at the end, but I don't really think that planners are imprisoned by that. That's public diplomacy, and then there's also a track with insurance and shipping and other kinds of targeted sanctions that are that it's much more granular, more the sort of Treasury's track. The, the problem is that I don't think that the targeted institutions and individuals are as brittle and, and as um, easily reached as the analogous situations. Not, none of the evidence from Iran, as opaque as it is, as complicated as it is, but when you really go down and look at the flow charts of families and leaderships and clerics and institutional relationships, these institutions and individuals who are being targeted are self-funded in very resilient and elastic organizations. And as long as um, 
Iran is able to ship unrefined, uh, petro uh, unrefined oil and gas, there's going to be so much money flowing through those self-funding organizations and networks that I, I think they'll remain resilient absent some kind of political uh, turning point, which again, I don't see evidence. Do, do you think that we're going to have to learn to live with a nuclear capable uh, Iran? I mean, well, we're, you know, we're just about there, aren't we? I mean, to, to some extent, the question is, what is the dynamic by which Iran manages the decision about whether to go from capability to, to deployment or to capacity? And what is the pace at which they make that decision? Um, you know, there are, there are those who argue that it is still possible that even this Iranian regime would decide not to weaponize um, if the right international equation is created beyond the virtual weaponization that they're already pursuing and the missile capacity that they're already building. I mean, you know, you can, you can get to a fairly fine point on these questions. But um, in any event, they already have the capacity in, um, in a fuel cycle sense, and they have the intellectual capacity, and it's not at all clear that anyone can take that away from them. Do you, uh, how long will, uh, getting back to Israel, how long will Israel tolerate that? Um, At what level do they no longer tolerate? You know, I, none of us really know, Bob. I, I, um, I would agree with something Steve said. I, I think that Iran has an interest in, you know, leaving all the parts on the table and not actually weaponizing and not, A, making itself an easy target. I, I, I'd say that's one thing I would agree with. The other thing that just has to strike you as you watch the diplomacy around this issue is that um, nobody wants Iran to get a bomb and nobody wants to use military force to stop it. I didn't even put the Israelis in that category. Um, my guess is based on absolutely, I mean, the, if you notice the statements coming out of the Arab world, um, Prince Saud of Saudi Arabia basically said to us at Bob Gates who was visiting, um, yep. uh, kind of what are you and the Israelis waiting for? You know, I mean, uh, it was quite a remarkable uh, public statement and that's been communicated privately just as much, I, I've been saying for a long time, if Israel does decide to use an airstrike against Iran, there's gonna be a lot of Arab radar off that night. <laughs> oh, Mohammed, you didn't turn the radar on? You know, um, uh, I can guarantee you that. Um, that said, based on absolutely no information whatsoever, um, and I think if this is the plot of David's last book or will be the plot of his next book. Um, <laughs> if I were to bet anything um, it would be you will pick up the paper one morning and read about a terrible fire in the Natanz nuclear reactor. And people will all look up and say, was it lightning? Was it, you know, um, because the problem with an external airstrike is multifold. First of all, you will get a retaliation. And for Israel, it could be quite substantial. And second of all, you actually strengthen the regime. The beauty of an internal explosion um, is that it makes the regime look weak and it's impossible to retaliate against. Who did that? It was a fire, it was bad, bad wiring. And so I have a feeling that given the um, uh, events inside Iran today, there are a lot of people for sale. Um, and that there are a lot of people who do not like this regime. And uh, based on absolutely no information, I have to believe um, that uh, David's next book will be about the Mossad, uh, MI6, the CIA, all working independently and collectively to turn uh, Iranian nuclear uh, physicists into um, putting in some really bad wiring, and you will read one day of a very bad fire there. That's where I put my money. Well, that, that was my last book. <laughs> it makes a great gift. Um, I seen you up, Father, David. Father's Day is coming up. Um, the, the book was called The Increment. Um, the, um, and the, the book speculates, I want to I wanna underline speculates, about uh, the way in which a clandestine uh, sabotage program that seeks to inter, inter, intervene in the Iranian supply chain could uh, introduce um, problems for the Iranian nuclear program that would uh, delay the progress that they expected to make and uh, would result in a much slower pace of enrichment of, of nuclear materials uh, and, and other, other problems. And that, in fact, 
um, is what we're seeing. I just would note that if you look carefully at IAEA reports uh, coming out of Iran, what's striking is that they keep running these centrifuges, although fewer and fewer of them seem to work, and their output of enriched material is steady. Even as they, they claim they're adding more capability, they're not getting any more output. Why is that? What's the problem here? Are they having technical problems with the equipment that they imported uh, and, and have been using? You know, what could have happened here? So this is, you know, an area we can speculate about. What? The, just to, just to, the, the, what Tom is introducing is another uh, level of this discussion. If we were talking, you know, in, in, in government, we'd say that uh, we want to move to having uh, a lethal program because you can't have a fire in Natanz without the risk of people getting killed. Um, and, you know, with nuclear materials, there are all sorts of collateral uh, dangers. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's a complicated line to, 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 to cross. I w I, it certainly would be complicated for our government. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's, it's not knowing anything, probably best to, to leave it there. Um, the, the only thing I want to add to this is that um, a year ago, Iran looked like it was on a roll. Iran looked like this unstoppable force in the Middle East. Everywhere that Tom and Steve and I travel, you know, you'd find the Iranians uh, gaining strength, funding groups. You know, they were waging a kind of across-the-board covert action program from Iraq to Lebanon to Egypt uh, with remarkable success. You know, it was the, the most really striking uh, instance of covert action that, I, that I've seen uh, in that part of the world. I think that after their election and the you know, way in which the regime has been ex you know, exposed as, as having a, a very weak base, you know, Iran used to be proud of its democracy, proud that morally it was different from Saudi Arabia and Egypt and the, all these other places that essentially have authoritarian regimes. They can't say that anymore, and that's a big change. And I, and I think it is something, you know, as we think about the future of that part of the world, well, I, I agree with Steve that the Iranians are, you know, tough and smart and hard to, hard to reach. They are so much weaker than they were in terms of the fundamentals a year ago, in my judgment. Let me, let me just ask you all in quickly, because I do want to talk about Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, Not a requirement. Uh, what if the Israelis come to this administration as the National Security Advisor and say, we've taken all we can take on Iran? Uh, we're going to we're going to go for it. We're not going to do what Tom Friedman said. We're going to we're going to bomb them. What does our government say to them? I, I don't know, Bob. I think it's a real dilemma. I, I um, if you take the little things that have been said um, by different officials over the year, the past year, clearly we've got our own planning going on um, uh, for how we would do this if it came to that. Um, but I think it would be a, just a, a huge, huge dilemma. So I'm not sure the Israelis could, you're talking about multiple targets, which means multiple sorties, almost certainly over multiple days. Because if you do this, you cannot miss, okay? So you, if you're gonna shoot, you better shoot to kill because you're not gonna get a second chance and you're gonna have to absorb a huge retaliation. I'm still not convinced the Israelis can do this uh, on their own without us. And I'm not sure they have the bunker busting bombs to do it. It is ironic though that the head of Israeli military intelligence is the man who piloted the plane who put the bomb through the roof of the Iraqi nuclear reactor. And he knows a lot about this. And I won't speak for him, but I think there are a lot of people there who are very sober about how difficult this would be. Yeah, what, think, what do we well, do? I think it's important to be clear about what Iranian capacity is now because it is distinct from having a single Iraq uh, reactor as in Syria or in Iraq, and it also uh, goes to this question of what is your strategy over time. I agree that a clandestine approach, including one that has psychological aspects of so the appearance of a clandestine approach is superior politically to overt bombing, but in either case, let's remember, we know a lot about Iranian capability. They got a full package of blueprints and technology uh, almost 20 years ago from the Pakistanis. They're on their second generation of centrifuge technology. They have multiple generations of engineers that have worked on this. It's tricky, hard, really difficult. Even if you've got great electricity and beautiful, clean environments, it's hard. So they struggle with it, and it may be that we're helping them struggle with it as well. But there is an enormous um, breadth of infrastructure on 
the weaponization side, the military side. They have, for all, almost everyone, a certain clear Chinese blueprints for a pretty simple bomb to make. Uh, they, so it's not obvious that even the best targeting lists buy you more than a few years. And it's absolutely the case. I, I have not heard anyone argue otherwise that you would need a lot of time over target. You'd, you'd really need 14 days, 21 days mm -hmm. to really feel like you'd taken your best shot at buying five years or something along those lines. David. I, I think, I, think uh, I agree with, with uh, Steve's analysis. You asked, what should the United States say to Israel as Israel um, sees the, the Iranians continuing with this program? Let's, let's say a few months from now, if, if serious UN sanctions are not enacted, what, what would you say to the Israelis? And I think the first thing you'd say is don't start something you can't finish. Don't start something in the expectation that we'll have to come in and get the job done. And I am not convinced from what I know, that the Israelis have the capability to, to, to take this program out in a way that would decisively uh, alter uh, the, the, the balance. Um, so in initiating a strike, I think they'd, they'd be hoping that, that, we would, that we would come in. And, and you know, I, I've heard people from, from Arab governments in the region say, if the Israelis do strike, we, we hope the United States will, will destroy the power of the Revolutionary Guard regime that has essentially you know, seized power in, in Tehran. Um, I think what we are saying to the Israelis is that it is not in our interest at a time when we're still involved in two wars to get into a third. And we are telling you that any a action of this sort on your part is contrary to American interests. And we, you know, we tell you, as your crucial ally, do not act against our interests. And I think that, that argument was made emphatically, pretty much in those terms, uh, during the final year of the Bush administration. I think it's been reiterated uh, by officials of the Obama administration. And it's, as I understand it, it's basically on those terms. It is contrary to our interests. You have to decide what your interests are, but we're telling you it is contrary to our interests for you to do this now, and my sense, for what it's worth, I, I'd be curious if Tom and Steve agree with this, is that basically um, the Israelis are not likely to take uh, action of this sort, certainly this year. I, I, just, I just don't see it, don't see it happening. I just say one quick thing. I think the people who are most sober about this in Israel uh, are uh, the military, um, in, in my sense. All right, let's, uh, let's shift over to, to your territory, uh, Steve, Afghanistan. Uh, this is now President Obama's war. I think a lot of people would say that now. He sent all these troops over there. Did he do the right thing? How's it going? And where do you see this going and bring in Pakistan along with it? Well, I think he did the right thing myself. Um, and I think it's early days in the three big lines of operation that this campaign contemplates. There are, um, I think right now, sort of more optics than substance to measure. but plan is in motion, and it's clear where it's going. And I think there is one area where the, the ball has moved a little bit further than in two others. So uh, the three critical uh, risks, lines of investment and operation that have to interact with each other are to build Afghan security forces, to change the equation on the ground sufficiently to protect a, an adequate Afghan state. So I use that very carefully, not to suggest that Afghanistan is going to be remade or the experience of all Afghan nationals of their government is going to change profoundly. But there has to be a reversal of the Taliban's challenge to, this, to even a weak state. So that's the counterinsurgency piece. And then the third and the most critical one is to uh, influence Pakistan's decision making about its own interests in the war and to convert Pakistani support for the Taliban from a covert campaign to support a violent proxy militia to a political strategy that seeks to pursue Pakistan's interests by other means than Taliban violence. And by creating that conversion, buy enough space for the Afghan security forces to be built up to a sustainable uh, force in the next sort of three to four or five years. Now, of those three lines of operation, the Afghan Security Force Project has you know, been under-resourced for years. 
every time the United States government recommits to it, it still seems to be slow to get off the launch pad. There are sources of success in the Army. The police are still a chronic uh, problem. It's early days, but everyone that I speak to involved in the project recognizes that it's an uncertain project, may not work. You're, you are asking the Afghan security forces to play, to some extent, a role they've never played in Afghan national life. On the other hand, there are uh, lots of sources in Afghan history to support the view that Afghanistan can have a successful army, a multi-ethnic army that, that performs the function the United States contemplates to it. But anyway, big risky project. Um, on the counterinsurgency side, barely begun. Marja is just a, a kind of a priming the pump operation. The big campaign is going to be in Kandahar. What's interesting about that is they're not, they're not only going to have to push the Taliban out of all the space that the Taliban owns in Kandahar province and, and out toward the Pakistani border, they're also going to have to clean up the Afghan government in the same, without quite saying that that's what they're doing. So this is a counterinsurgency operation that is aimed both at the enemy and at the ally in some uh, respect. But the area where I actually think things are shaking around and changing and interesting things are happening are in the strategic negotiations um, with Pakistan. And uh, it's a very complicated subject that I won't try to break down here because I'd go on too long. But I would say that there is more honest discussion. There is a more realistic discussion. There is a fuller exchange of views about each side's actual interests as opposed to their arguments to each other uh, than I've seen in tracking this over a long period of time. It's not obvious to me what the Pakistan government particularly the army, is going to decide about how to play its hand here. I think they are still arguing with themselves about that. And I'm not sure that we are uh, as far along in our own efforts to f push them, to create the perfect blend of incentives and disincentives to get them to convert their covert violent war to politics. But I have to say that it's, it's a much more adult exchange and a fuller conversation than uh, our government's managed to have, or theirs for that matter, uh, certainly since 9-11. But this is going to take a long, long time. Well, you know, the Pakistanis have a proposition to them, which is if you want to protect your interests in Afghanistan, and if you agree that a Taliban government, a revolutionary government that is engaged in the pursuit of revolutionary violence against your own state is not the outcome you're seeking, since it really seems like an irrational goal to pursue, then you have an alternative course, which is, and now is the time, to achieve by political means what you have sought to achieve by covert war. And we are offering you the pathway to get yourself to the table and to define your interests in a post-American Afghanistan and to define in specific terms how you want to lever your position to secure your existence against India, your strength against India, to manage your portfolio with India. And if you don't seize the moment now to convert your long self-defeating policies of proxy violence to political tracking with our support and our partner, you're never going to get a pr better price than we're offering right now. Because you know we want out of here. <laughs> we recognize that you are offering partnership to help us get out in a way that leaves a stable, independent, viable Afghan state behind. But this deal is not available you know, in 2014. If this, and, and there is an even subtler aspect of this. is If we succeed in building the Afghan security forces right on their border, or if we fail, and they don't seize this moment to negotiate for their interests, they lose. They end up with either a muscular, independent Afghan army sitting right on top of their border that isn't really aligned with their idea of what Afghanistan should be, or the security forces crack up and they get the civil war that will create certain instability in Pakistan for the next 10 or 15 years. Tom, do you want to add to that? You know, um, Steve's forgotten more about Afghanistan and Pakistan than I know, so um, I had the pleasure of being on the Pulitzer board when uh, we gave Ghost Words a Pulitzer. So uh, I really deferred to him. All, you know, I, I was a dove on Afghanistan, or to say uh, I really did not want to go in farther. I expended an enormous amount of intellectual capital um, and I guess journalistic capital supporting the Iraq War, uh, uh, which I still support and still hope will come out well. So um, all I know is, uh, you know, the whole thing, uh, my, own, my own view was change Iraq, you really change the Arab world. You change a huge, uh, great Arab capital. 
I felt you got less resonance out of Afghanistan. I understand why the president did what he did. I really wish them well. I'll do anything. I'll write anything that will support it. <laughs> but I, I really, I'm still trying to babysit this other one right now called Iraq, and I'm just going to leave it at that. You know, so and I'm still still sitting on that egg. You know, so. <laughs> that. That and egg is, uh, is, is hatching, what it looks like. I don't um, know what the baby looks like, though. <laughs> I, like, uh, like, like Steve, uh, disagreeing a, uh, some with Tom, I, I thought that the President's decision was, uh, was, was basically uh, correct. Um, I think what the President was deciding was that the only exit ramp from Afghanistan is one that involves consolidating the situation on the ground and giving the Afghan government the best chance possible uh, to, to survive and, and govern uh, with institutions that start off weak, a uh, weak army, weak police, but, but get stronger and, and, and hopefully make it. And uh, I think that's, that's right. I think the idea that you can just leave places that are a mess and say, that ah, didn't work out so long. Um, that's just wrong, and I think that what happened in Iraq um, uh, taught us that, um, that, that there is a difference between a really bad outcome and an outcome that's just sort of bad, you know, or just okay, which is kind of what we have now. I mean, no one would describe today's Iraq as a, you know, a country in, in, in great shape. It's still so fragile, you can't be certain, but there's a big difference between the way it is now and the way it was in 2006 when the, the pressure, political pressure in the United States to bail out was enormous. You know, and so I, th I, th I think we, we all ought to have learned something from that. There, there's a difference between 2006, Iraq, and, and, and 2009, 2010. And I, and I hope that'll be true in Afghanistan. I, it's, I don't think that by July 2011, when the President says he will begin to withdraw troops, that we're gonna see, you know, uh, uh, fully realized project, a, co a country that's, that's stable, an army that's strong. But if, you know, there's an, there are an awful lot of smart people involved in this, I, you know, like, I'm sure like Steve and, and Tom, whenever I travel overseas to these war zones, the, the thing I'm most struck by is the quality of the U.S. military. I mean, the, the people in the military have learned so much, and I don't just mean about fighting, but about, but about working in other cultures, about about dealing with different kinds of uh, people, about uh, solving. These people on their second, third, fourth tours really are, 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 are skillful. So, uh, you know, you'd, you'd have to, to, to say that they, you know, they're, they're, they're working hard, they're really smart, and you, and you hope they'll succeed. Pakistan, um, I agree with Steve. The, the difference that I've seen in the last year, I mean, in April when I was there for the first time last year, I really thought the country was coming apart. The Taliban was breaking out of the Swat Valley into Bunair, the neighboring uh, district, moving toward Islamabad. The whole the country seemed incapable of dealing with the crisis, the, the existential crisis that the Taliban seemed to me to pose. And uh, they got it together. In the, in the next couple of months, they pulled together. The, the, the military uh, decided it was going to get serious and really fight these guys in the Swat Valley, and they were successful. And militaries like to win. They like to be popular. And the Pakistani army found, to its, to its pleasure, that people really liked what it did. And they were encouraged by that. And they, they went into South Waziristan. That was a more ambiguous operation because they left so many people untouched. But again, they, they felt good about what they were doing. They're getting pounded. I mean, the number of military and intelligence officers you know, who have been targeted in these Taliban bombings. It's just, I mean, you know, it is really dangerous to be a Pakistani military or ISI officer now. And, you know, that makes people mad. And they're, I think they're getting more serious. So I think Steve's basic point is right, that the key thing that's happened strategically is this change in, in, in Let's Pakistan. just go around quickly and touch on Iraq. What do you, what would, how would you evaluate Iraq right now, uh, Steve, and what's happening there? Is this going to be all right? I mean, we're getting ready to leave. Um, well, I, you know, I, I think that I, David's characterization is, I, I'll sign up for that. I think if you um, look at the fault lines, the fundamental fault lines that were present in the, in the worst of the Civil War, 2006, 2007, um, some things are better and some things haven't changed. 
So the status of the Kurds and the negotiation over their place in Iraq strikes many of the people who come and go from that negotiation over a long period of time as, as sort of fundamentally still um, structural. And the question that was at issue in this election, which is whether or not a new uh, non-sectarian nationalism could emerge from democratic politics, at least uh, pulling Sunni and Shia together to negotiate peacefully with Kurdish claims, which would be a sustainable path. I'm, I'm watching the results. I'm trying to figure out whether that's actually going to happen uh, or not. I, you know, the, you take heart from the aspiration, and then you, you're, so, you're sobered by the record of performance uh, of these governments after these votes. And you know, there is, in the end, probably a limit to how much uh, mediocrity uh, these kind of seismic problems can, can withstand from, from the leaders who are now you know, sort of called upon to, to live up to the promise that many of them campaigned on. Tom, what would you say at this point uh, in our history is the biggest threat out there against the United States right now? Um, I think the biggest threat we face is um, uh, a really slow but steady erosion of our economic strength and innovative power in this country. Um, there's a lot of bad things in the world that happen um, without the United States of America. There are not a lot of good things that happen at scale in the world without the United States of America, whether it's the recovery of Europe, the stabilization of Asia, stabilization of Central Asia, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, that Steve and David have referred to. Um, and so uh, if you want to know why I haven't written a column until this week about the Arab-Israeli conflict. If, if you want to know why I really wasn't throwing my, myself into Afghanistan, it wasn't because I hadn't studied it or didn't understand the arguments that Dave and uh, uh, Steve have made. I, I, I respect them. I, I really hope they're right. It's that my real focus right now is nation building at home. I, I really think my country has lost its groove. I think that um, we have a political system that is um, in peril that cannot produce optimal solutions. And if you, as I tell my European friends, if you did not like a world with too much American power, trust me, you are really not going to like a world with too little American power. And I think we are really in peril of that. And I think it is the biggest domestic and foreign policy issue for the United States of America. How about the, the relationship with China? Well. Um, I, I think we all recognize that the, the big issue for the rest of, 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 of my life, our lives, is going to be the rise of this very powerful China and uh, how the United States and its power fits uh, with China. Uh, I, I am not one of those people who think that we are fated to collide, that, that there is an inevitable conflict between, between the two. The Chinese clearly made a decision on their way up that they were going to kind of uh, slipstream us. You know, it's like in stock car racing. There's this you know, big, fast car in the lead, and another car slips in behind, and you know, doesn't have to, doesn't have to hit the pedal as hard. And that's what the Chinese have been doing. They've been following in our wake, accommodating to our interests, accepting, accepting the reality of, of our power. I don't think they're going to challenge that in a, in a military or strategic sense any, anytime soon. So I, I, I think the notion we have to, to have all sorts of new weapon systems to deal with a Chinese threat is, is a mistake. I think that the, that the Chinese system is somewhat more fragile than, than I think Tom does. Um, I, I think the problems in the Chinese eco economy, the very opacity of the Chinese systems, the, the fact that it's so hard really to understand what the numbers mean, you know, what, what's the level of, 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 cr of credit and the potential problems of uh, of, of debt, what, you know, what's the nature of the overheating? What is the is the bubble in China? Uh, I think those are real problems. The reason I think they're real is because the Chinese leadership keeps referring to them and about its own worries about them, and they don't say that unless they're actually worried. But but uh, uh, the Prime Minister uh, Wen has been has been very clear about that in the last couple of weeks. Um, I I'm going to disagree with Tom a little bit on on one point, which is that. In the, in the year 
year and a half since the financial disaster, you know, we had an absolute panic in global financial markets. Complete breakdown of trust. Nobody knew what anybody else had or was doing, and you, you, know, you had markets just about to lock up. And I've been struck recently, to be honest, by the resilience of the American system. I mean, this is still an American-led global financial system. And you know, trust, liquidity, all the things that make global commerce are coming back into the system. And to me, that's a sign of the strength of parts of our system. You know, the, 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 I think the global economy is going to come back pretty strong. What worries me is our political <coughs> system. We really have a, a breakdown. We cannot make decisions about issues that matter to the country. We can't, you know, we, President Bush had a good idea for dealing with immigration, uh, you know, very sensible policy. He couldn't get anywhere with it. Uh, President Obama has been struggling to deal with an issue we all know is a, is a fundamental issue for the country, which is how are we going to deliver health care? How are we going to make it work? And he can't, you know, I mean, it's just so painful to watch. And that, that dysfunction of our political system, I think, is, is, a, is a huge problem. I think President Obama is, un, understands it, is trying to deal with it. And, you know, we all, we all see he's not getting very far. But can I say once, because I've got to run. Yeah, if I, if, we're going to. I've got, got it. I, I, um, uh, because I'm, I'm, the reason I got to leave is actually a really good thing. I get to be the speaker at the Intel Science Awards tonight, okay, for, for all the, the next generation uh, American scientists. And if there's one reason for hope, it's there. So um, I'm going to slip out and let you guys finish. Uh, all right. Steve, that's okay. you want just Thank some you. closing okay. remarks? No, i just say We're one done. thing about China. Oh, just, okay, uh, fine. Well, I, I don't know how to uh, penetrate the opacity of China. And I, I read David very carefully on this um, and think he's made some very careful observations about Chinese leadership's eyesight on their own economy. But the observation that I hold in my mind, and we're all influenced by our experience, mine is as an India person. So here's, India has a huge uh, internal demand-led economy that has already sorted out many of the pressures of politics and pluralism that a rapidly changing society driven by economic growth and middle class formation has to cope with. China, on the other hand, hasn't sorted out the legacy of the Cultural Revolution or any of the challenges of pluralism that are going to be created by rapid social change caused by middle class formation and, and sustained economic growth. So if you look at big emerging societies and economies, especially those that adhere to some version of free market rules, I can't think of one that hasn't had a bust come up at one point or another. I mean, it's just the way we innovate. It's the way these societies. And so all I think about when I think about China is they have not actually been tested yet. If you bring the global financial crisis crashing down on India, they know how, uh, they've, they've already built resilient systems politically and socially to deal with that. They have challenges of inequality coming and other pressures on their society. But I just wonder, once you move past this march that China has enjoyed, what stresses uh, China has not yet tested in its own social and political fabric. And I'd be very interested. I think that's coming over the next 20 years, one way or another. Say one thing. I think that's all true. And China's got bubbles and all of these things. But um, I think the adaptability and resilience of that system may be far more than, than we realize. I make no predictions. But one thing that did strike me being in Hong Kong in January is that what if, when you look at the infrastructure that China's put in place and the education of now 28 million students in the university system. You put that infrastructure with that education, and what if, I don't know, but what if, what if we haven't seen anything yet? I think on that note, <laughs> thank you all very much. <laughs> CSIS and TCU. Great to see you. That's good. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to see you. Pleasure to be with you. I really enjoy your stuff.